My name is Makatai Meishi Kyakyak. The white people call me Black Hawk. I collected a party of 30 braves. We started in canoes and descended the Mississippi until we arrived near the place where Fort Madison had stood. It had been abandoned by the whites and burnt. Nothing remained but the chimneys. We were pleased to see that the white people had retired from our country. Twenty years later, the frontier had changed. Black Hawk was a prisoner of war, dictating his autobiography. Many of his people were dead, massacred. And his people's land west of the Mississippi was to become the Iowa Territory. One of the river towns was named Fort Madison, built beside the rubble of the old frontier outpost. Fort Madison was built in 1808 to stem the growing tide of British influence in American territory. Winter quarters the first year had few buildings and had a temporary stockade of thin posts with many gaps and only five feet high. The fort protected a United States government trading post, part of a network of trading posts established by the government to sell inexpensive trade goods to the Indians and win their allegiance away from the British. But many things went wrong at Fort Madison. The fur trade was mishandled. Administrative problems occurred, and the fort itself was poorly planned. Then the War of 1812 renewed the conflict between Great Britain and the United States. For a time, Indians, led by the British, swept over the American frontier, attacking the forts and capturing them one by one. Fort Madison stood isolated and withstood Indian attacks. But in 1813, the soldiers abandoned the fort, leaving it in flames behind them. They retreated to St. Louis. Gradually, traces of the old fort disappeared. The face of the landscape changed, and the old fort became mere legend. Even its location was no longer certain and many believe that the charred ruins were destroyed or covered by the waters of the Mississippi. For the river too had changed, rising behind locks and dams. But there was a tradition remembered in the town of Fort Madison that the fort had been near the center of town, buried under the parking lot of the Schaefer Pen Company. In 1965, construction workers in the parking lot were cutting deep trenches to lay new lines and tanks. An archaeologist was there to see if any trace of the old fort was present. A limestone foundation was emerging. It was made of limestone rubble, laid together without mortar, without cement. Each layer of rock was set in tightly with packed clay, and another layer was added. It was an old foundation. As archaeologists cleared away more earth from the rock, Looking away from the outside walls, they found the stones formed a cellar 20 feet square. It was a small building, but a substantial one. But could it be the fort? In size, the cellar might be either of two blockhouses lying on a north-south diagonal. But no records had ever mentioned cellars under the fort buildings. Fort Madison was an old river city established in 1833. Buildings had been set up, torn down, rebuilt, filled in. Perhaps this was, after all, a building from a later period. Then bronze buttons were found. These uniform buttons confirm the identification of Fort Madison. This button is marked 1R, meaning 1st Regiment, the insignia of the 1st United States Infantry Regiment, part of the garrison. Special buttons like these were not used later by the Army. This button 
showing a cannon, probably dropped off an artilleryman's uniform. Charred beams were clearly visible on the cellar floor. They had fallen in from the upper floor of the blockhouse and in the thick smoke and collapsed debris had not completely burned. Lower beams ran parallel to the cellar walls and the upper beams ran diagonally. The study of beams showed that the blockhouse had a diagonally set second story. This replica, built from the archaeological plans, shows the type of construction. At one side of the cellar of the blockhouse, there was a door sill and a clay step with a small retaining wall extending away from the foundation. It was a cellar entryway reached by an outside set of stairs. A vertical door hung from pental hinges and swung inward. An iron strap held a drawbar for locking the door from the inside. Clenched nails show plank thickness. Other hinges, found by the entryway, supported a cellar storm door to keep rain from running down the stairs into the cellar. The clenched nails show the door was two inches thick. There was also evidence of intense fire when the fort burned. Pieces of glass had melted in the heat of the huge beams burning. This teapot, shattered in the destruction of the blockhouse, had served the men on duty. This present for writing well is inscribed with a pun. It's an inkwell. There were handmade nails made by a blacksmith. These were stamped nails made in a press and shipped up by the keg to the fort. And there were puddles of lead which had dripped down into the basement during the fire. The Fox Indians mined tons of lead, bartering it at the trading post. Trade beads for sale to the Indians. This bullet mold is not military issue. A small caliber ball fits a Kentucky rifle for hunting. Rusted shut now, it once opened like a pair of pliers. Lead balls of various calibers were found. A broken English gun flint. Triangular files perhaps for gun repairs. Meanwhile, archaeological crews were finding traces of other buildings and remains. Charred stumps of the West Stockade appeared. The posts were set in a trench, which was then refilled. The shovel marks of the original trench can be seen along the irregular sides. A foundation for one of the fireplaces in the enlisted men's barracks occurred right next to the modern highway under a sidewalk. Construction for modern sewer lines cut through the foundation of the officers' quarters. Like the back blockhouse, it had a storage cellar and an outside set of stairs. Inside the foundations of the officers' cellar, interesting artifacts were found. One officer's wife brought her fine English china to the frontier. many fragments of English china, cottage wares, and transfer wares. A carved bone handle for an officer's sword or large knife. Silverware left behind when the fort was abandoned. This child's marble was lost or left behind. Stoneware crocks stored some of the officer's food. Fragments of clay pipes were very common. Thin glass from window panes. A lead base held a spindle, part of office equipment. Stylus tips for wax tablets used instead of scratch paper. A brass tip for an officer's gold braid. 
a wine bottle, medicine bottle, a whetstone fragment for sharpening, broken scissors. Only the officers' quarters were plastered. A cobblestone sidewalk led around the officers' quarters. And there was a cobblestone veranda in front. Back of the kitchen was a privy. The blockhouses and stockade at the front of the fort lay by coincidence under a narrow strip of land between the railroad tracks and highway. A chimney monument erected by the Daughters of the American Revolution years before on the approximate site of the old fort had since been arbitrarily moved to the strip of ground. Digging in its shadow, the crew was able to locate and identify the limestone footings of the front blockhouse. The earth from the cellars was screened with water so nothing would be lost. The bits of crockery, nails and other remains were the debris of human history. When the town of Fort Madison was settled in 1833, the cobblestone walkways could still be seen. An early visitor lost this large scent piece, little worn and dated 1830. It was lying between two cobblestones. From the study of the ruins, it was now possible to reconstruct the exact appearance of the fort. A cardboard model was made to provide perspective. And a final drawing of the fort was made as it appeared in 1810. The officers' quarters, officers' kitchens, barracks, gate, front blockhouses, guardhouse powder magazine. The 15-foot high stockade must have had a rifle platform inside for the soldiers to stand on. The rear blockhouse, which had a cellar. The trading post was outside the rear wicket gate. The blockhouse was on the back ridge to help protect the rear of the fort. We didn't excavate all of these buildings. How do we know what they looked like? The buildings which we studied provide us architectural patterns. But time had run out. The underground construction project was nearing completion, and the archaeological excavations were refilled. The foundations were covered with sheets of plastic to help preserve them. For this was the first American fort in the upper Mississippi Valley, and for five years, one of the most distant outposts on the frontier. I'm a state archaeologist of Iowa, and I directed excavations at the ruins in 1965. Many foundations remain unexplored under the parking lot. I hope someday that the fort can be permanently uncovered and preserved, rising again from its grave as part of the American frontier heritage. This film was made under a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Washington, D.C.